Okay, we have Jason Williams in the building. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, Vlad. Let me first start off by telling you, man, I've been following you for like 10 years. I remember when you first started, I was like, wow, this is interesting. And every year, just watching you grow. Congratulations to you, brother. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you coming in to tell your story because I think it's such a, such a powerful story of triumph and defeat and then back to triumph again and losses and gains and so forth. And, and I really want to get into the whole story because I know you've done a lot of other interviews, but we do things a little bit differently here where we really give the timeline okay. of, of everything that happens. So I really want to get into that way. Um, so let's go ahead and start in the beginning. So were you born in South Carolina or New York? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. You know, yeah. I was born in New York City, Beth Israel Hospital, 19th Street, 1st Avenue. Okay, but then you moved to South Carolina? Yeah, moved down to South Carolina. My parents, I have an African-American father and a white mother, and they thought, hey, it's the early 70s, let's escape racism, let's move to the rural South uh, with that interracial marriage, and uh, let's see if it works. And then Alex Ru Haley came out with Roots, and then getting on the school bus as a high yellow kid with Blonde hair with a white mother and a black father in the deep south. I got the crap beat out of me every day. Right, because these days, interracial marriage and relationships and mixed kids, that's like really common. But I remember, you know, because I'm 46 years old. Uh, I think I'm a little bit younger than you. And I remember my first girlfriend in college who was black. This was like 1992. A lot of people would stare when we were walking down the street. Like it was... It was an oddity. It was a thing. Right. You know, these days, no one cares. Right. But even back then in Berkeley, which is considered progressive in the North, it was still kind of a weird thing. So back then, when you were a kid, it was probably a very distinctive situation. Well, let me tell you, Vlad, we had a pig farm uh, and a corn farm. Uh, and I used to have to get up in the morning. I was so happy. I was seven years old. I got to drive the tractor and feed the pigs. And I feed up all our pigs. And we never took them to slaughter or anything like that. We were more pets. And you started off with about 20, and then before we knew it, we had a few hundred, and it kept growing. Uh, but I fed them, and then the school bus would come up, and I wanted all the kids to see me on the tractor. And uh, I'd jump on the school bus, and I don't know if they moved because I was high yellow and white, father, white mother and black father, or I just smelled like the pig pen. But whatever it was, you know, it was rough because, look, I was the only child between my mother and father we had. Uh, everybody else was from previous marriages. Uh, so I didn't have a whole lot of love from a whole lot of family at that time. So they say 80% of what you learn in school, you learn on the way to school, on the school bus, on the train. And um, it was tough, man. That was a tough situation for me. I didn't have many friends. Well, you kind of had somewhat of a difficult situation at home. Because uh, I read both of your books. Wow, thank you. Yeah, and I guess you had seen your father shoot three different people on three different occasions? Yeah, um, he, he had a nightclub and a business. Uh, and he was a construction, he was in tractor trailer business. And uh, yeah, he, he would fire his weapon, not all of them hit, but he would fire his weapon at people. Uh, and my father was a great man, he's my best friend. It wasn't like he was just, uh, he wasn't a big drinker. Uh, he was protecting his family or his business at that time. Okay, so you say not everyone got hit, but did he actually shoot someone and hit him? Yes, he did shoot somebody and hit them. Um, somebody had a, broke a pool stick over my back and did some things to me and hit him in the leg one time, uh, but did not kill anybody, no. Okay, was he charged for any of those shootings? No, in the rural south back then, 50 years ago, um, it was pretty much template. You took care of business the way you took care of business. Guy broke a bottle over his face, uh, tried to cut him, and we were all family anyway, believe it or not. Well, everybody down there is related, so. Your mother actually shot at your father at one point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad uh, came home and was somewhere he wasn't supposed to be. My mother had enough of it, and he was trying to climb out the window and his boot back in the day used to wear these boots and had the big heels on the back. And he was like, hey, and, and he got clipped on, hooked on the window. And he was like trying to whisper because my mom was trying to get in this side of the bedroom door. And um, 
you know, that was after though, Vlad, because he went to take a shower and I think my mom just went to scare him and she shot three times through the bathroom door and uh, he was in the shower and she knew he was in the shower. She's just trying, but he tried to jump out the window while she was going to go get a knife or whatever. And I remember being about eight years old and this, this, you know, and, and he's like, Jay, get the boot loose, get the boot. I'm like a little kid. I thought I was helping my dad and I clicked the boot loose and I heard bing. And I, and I get up on the stool on the dresser and look down and he hit his head on the bird bath. Right. So my mother ended up catching him anyway. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it, it was quite the household, a loving household. Yeah. Vlad. It was a, my parents were loving. You know, they just okay. went through some stuff. There was a situation that you talked about in one of your books where you made a guy put his teeth on the curb. Yeah, that was that was not a uh, that was that was more BS than it was anything. A guy we got into something and the guy fell down and hit his head uh, on the curb. Uh, we had a fight. It wasn't me telling him to put his first face on the curb. That was incorrect. There was a okay. lot of stuff. When you wrote a lot of stuff back then, Vlad, a lot of stuff was uh, for low self-esteem reasons. You just let stuff go. A lot of stuff when you were writing stuff, uh, you know, you weren't in the right state of mind. You were rushing stuff. So, no, I would never, I never did that. Right, that sounded pretty crazy. That, that's like some old... Uh, yeah, that's how... Uh, it, it's like when people say Jay scored 100 points in high school and the story gets bigger and bigger. I don't think I've ever scored over 25 points at high school. The legend builds, you know? Right, yeah, because I was thinking American History X. Right, I remember right. When he... That's probably where that came from. Yeah. Okay, but then there was a situation with your sisters. Okay, yeah. so, so one of your sisters ended up getting robbed. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh... I came home, I was about, about 13 or 14 years old, um, came down the hallway at Cherry Street, and I saw some blood, and I was like, wow, where's this blood? Somebody must have cut their finger, cut their hand pretty bad, but then the blood led into my sister's apartment, the door was ajar. I went in, and she was laying on the floor. A guy named Sergio had stabbed her 17 times and beat her over the face with a hammer. My sister was a beautiful woman. She modeled for Salem cigarettes. She went in and got a blood transfusion. And she caught the AIDS virus. And it was not like where you're catching out. It was no medicine. It was pretty much people. We took the back door at hospitals like Bellevue. Um, and when she finally got home, uh, we had to take all the mirrors out of her house because she was deformed in her face because he broke the hammer over her face by hitting her so many times. Now my second sister, Sissy, um, we call her Sissy, her name is Laura. She started trying to help my sister and soothe her and started doing drugs with my sister who got hooked on heroin uh, before all the painkillers and stuff they were giving her. And they both started using drugs intravenously and um, both my sister caught the AIDS virus and uh, I lost both my sisters. Then some years later, my third sister, um, husband was having a bad day, came home, drunk, shot her in the face and killed her and then he killed himself. Um, I ended up having to take my two first sister's children and raise them, or they would have to go to Dyspis, um, Children's Services. Um, so I ended up adopting them, and it wasn't easy, but I never thought, now that I think about it, it wasn't easy, but then it was just the right thing to do. I signed to St. John's University, um, and I had two kids. I had a, like an 11-year-old and like a 7-year-old, and I had to wake up flat in the morning from Jamaica, Queens, and drive my uh, daughter, uh, uh, son, to Manhattan, and then beat the traffic back, and then wake my daughter up, bring her to school, and then after that, I had to go back to Manhattan, pick my son up, then pick my daughter up, then bring him to practice at St. John's, and then they will watch practice. At that time, we were practicing four and five hours a day, maybe six with Luke Conaseca. He's the reason they put the rule in. Um, and then, after that, I would have to help them with their homework, do my homework, 
feed them, bathe them, and then still try to do what an 18-year-old does playing for one of the most famous universities in the world and the only probably accolade that I give myself in my whole life is that my kids only miss five days of school and I got my degree in four years. Well, I looked, I mean, the back of the book uh, that you wrote, there was a picture of your two sisters, uh, the two that ended up dying from, from AIDS. Very beautiful girls. Right? Um, just such a, such a, I mean, I'm actually tearing up right now, like even talking about it. The guy who cut up your sister, he got only six years in prison. Right. But when he got out, you were waiting for him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I told this story on Oprah. Um, haven't thought much about it. Uh, but I had a guy from the neighborhood who was in love with my sister. He was like my bigger brother. Um, everybody, my sisters were very popular in the neighborhood. Everybody was very angry. They found the guy, they brought him to a parking lot and then they said, go ahead, Jay, do what you got to do, uh, to this man. Um, I, I couldn't do anything, but what they wanted me to do. I was very upset, but when I saw him, this man didn't know who I was. This man was an addict. This man robbed my sister. He didn't, wasn't personal. He was trying to get money to go feed his habit. So I did not do anything that they wanted me to do to this man. And for that, you know, if there's a such thing that we call street cred, you know, people are like, oh man, Jay, you know, all talk, you know, he was, he loved his sister so much, but he didn't do that. And it took until probably two years ago, the man died who put all this together. And he told me, man, we so glad we didn't do nothing like that. You know, and as you grow older, you know, the testosterone in your, and the recklessness and the stupidity of what you were thinking because you were angry at the time, you learned to pause. So was I even reckless by having them take this man to this place? Um, it was a different culture. It was a different time then. It was wrong. It was wrong, lads. And um, I'm glad I didn't harm the man. And I don't know where the man is today. Um, I know where my sisters are. My sisters are in heaven. And uh, I hope that God is a God of a, not a second chance, but a God of another chance. And I hope he has a family and he's doing well and uh, he's moved on from this. Well, you, you pistol whipped him. I, I gave back the pistol and I punched him. You punched uh, him. Okay. I punched him. I, you know, he didn't get hurt. It was, I hit the man and that was it. They wanted me to do something that, that's not in me. And then years later, you were having dinner with Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. and you guys talked about the situation. Right. Can, you, can you tell us about that? Whew. Yeah, uh, he was hurt from what happened to his dad, and he came up. He said, "Man, we're just alike. You know, I don't know what I'd have done if that happened to me, but you know, I, those situations when something happened. Look, I'm not going to throw Michael Jordan under the bus." Uh, he was upset what happened to his father, and I was upset, Vlad, what happened to my sisters. And it was pretty much, well, wow, you know, he didn't have the opportunity, probably thank God, to address the guys who did that to his dad. I did have the opportunity to address it, and I handled it in the best situation I think I could have at the point of maybe me not getting hurt in that situation by not doing nothing. <sighs> Well, yeah. I mean, in your book, you said uh, the Jordan told you if I ever come face to face with the guys who killed my father, I don't know if I could have let them go. Um, that might have been a little. Uh, he just said he was very. He might have said that he, but he was very upset. He was upset. You know, this book was twenty years ago. I wrote this book, gave the money to Michael J. Fox for Parkinson's disease. It's a book that, you know, uh, I was at a different level in life, but it it was something. Similar to he was very upset with them guys. Did you had to understand this had just happened to Michael Jordan? Yeah, uh, Parkinson's. Uh, my dad actually just died of Parkinson's. We, we buried him on Friday. It's a horrible, 
horrible disease. I'm sorry. Absolutely. And thank, thank and, you so and, much and for you know, me today. And you know what, Vlad, and Michael J. Fox helped my, my mother get on the list for the experimental drugs. It worked a lot better on my mom than, than it's working on Michael. But one of the things is she picked up the side effects was gambling. My mother never gambled. And the side effect is, you know, she, you couldn't go to my mom's house without a bingo or a scratch off or she, I had to buy a house upstate where she can get to a casino, you know, but she lived a long time. But like you said, it's a, it's a, a disease that, you know, it's tough to live with because you can't move around, you can't get around, you can't talk. You know, you can see Muhammad Ali in the later days and it's a frustrating thing. It's, a, it's like a time relay, you know it. It's, and it, it can be painful. I'm yeah, sorry, man. The, I'm sorry, Brad. I'm sorry about your dad. I'm true. Yeah, yeah. No, the, bear, the, the funeral was on Friday, and he passed away the, the previous Monday. Um, you know, and the hardest part with that, you know, because there's different forms of Parkinson's. In my case, his mind was fully intact. Right. His body just kept breaking down. Like, and, and his, especially his breathing became harder and harder. So, but he was fully 100% aware of everything that's happening. And that was, that was the hardest part. So The hardest part is being caught in your own body, right? That's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm sorry about your mother and thank you so much for donating. Cause you know, he did have some Parkinson's drugs, you know, that probably prolonged his life quite a bit, you know, at the end. Cause it's tough. You end up going to Christ the King High School? Yes. I went to Powell Memorial first with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lou Alcindor went. They closed, and I had to transfer to Christ the King High School. Okay. How good was Kareem back then? Do you think? I think Kareem might be the best center of all time. Uh, look, man, he couldn't even dunk back there. They changed the rules on him. And, uh, and I still don't understand why people don't do the jump hook, right? Why don't they go across the lane and do the jump hook? Because it ain't cool, right? It looks kind of... You know, so people don't do it, but it was unstoppable. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, is the probably, to me, the best center that ever played the game. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have a top 10 list and you don't include Kareem, you probably are kind of young. Well, well, who's <laughs> your, who, who, who do you put before Kareem? Yeah. I mean, it's, well, well, you know, the, the obviously other, Jordan the, and, and so forth. But, but at the center position, right, look, I... And then my second person would be Will Chamberlain because, look, he played every game of every game of his career. He played. He never fouled out. He didn't miss a game. He scored 100 points. He was averaging like 20-something rebounds. That's a great night for me. Um, and he played him in Chuck Taylor's. <laughs> right? Now guys right. get a hang toe with $700 sneakers on and miss three weeks. Remember that with Chuck Taylor's? You know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Or or Pumas. <laughs> Puma low tops. <laughs> yeah. Like like Clyde yeah. Frazier. <laughs> yeah. The dude didn't the dude never took off a game, man. Right. Yeah. So were you like a superstar player in high school? Like were you no. McDonald's All American? No. Heck no. Um I had no time. Remember, I had to take care of my sister's children. But when oh. I did get that little twenty minute or thirty minute break. In between, when I look down from the 24th floor and all, I'd be like, man, I wish my sister would fall asleep. And, and, and my little, you know, now, you know, my nephew at the time, you know, end up being my son, but my nephew would fall asleep so I could run down. But he always fell asleep around nine and I, everybody would have to go upstairs when the lights went on. And I would only have, lad, like 25, 30 minutes to practice. So, but I practiced for 25 or 30 minutes for real game situations. So, like my friends, like Tony and B. Young and Eddie and all these guys that would play, you know, Tony and B., they would shoot and, and they would shoot from three-pointers and this and lottie gagging. They didn't get any better. My sense of urgency and everything I've done in life made me better. Yeah, I mean, you're essentially a teen dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're kids raising kids. Yeah. Okay, so then you go to St. John's University. Yeah. And were you a big star? There? Uh, no, and not until my, I'll tell you a little story that, you know, I never, I played behind a big guy named Marco Baldi. So we played behind Marco Baldi and all my friends from the low east side would come and say, man, you playing behind that guy. You ain't going to never play. You a sophomore. He's a stiff. So I said, I tell you what y'all do. If I ever get a chance, I'm going to be good. 
I said, so come to the game. And when you come to the game, I said, when the second half starts, start chanting, we want Williams, we want Williams. So second half starts, Vlad, I look up and I go hit it. And they go, we want Williams, we want Williams, we want Williams. And then the coach said, Williams, get over here. And I come running up. I said, yes, Coach Conoseco, what do you want me to do? He says, son, I want you to take your ass into the stands with your friends because obviously they need you more than we do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that, that's an analogy of, of, of I could not take any shortcuts. I became uh, the NIT MVP. We won a national championship. Um, I had a great career at St. John's. I donated a couple million dollars back to St. John's. Uh, because that school made me, they were patient with me. I was a kid raising kids and um, they gave me every opportunity. I love it. It's the most famous place, uh, the most favorite safe place that I have. When I'm feeling it, I'm feeling bad about myself, I can always go back to St. John's University. So you do four years at St. John's and then you enter the draft. And you were first round, 21st pick? Yep, first round. Tell you a story there if we got time, you know. Sure. So we go to the draft, and I didn't want to go to the garden because my senior year I broke my foot. So only thing that my agent told my dad was he can go anywhere from five to twenty-five. But the only thing my dad heard was five. Understand? My <laughs> father's a dark man, lovable guy, uh, brick mason, uh, and he was sitting behind me with my mother, and I was sitting with Coach Carnesecca, and. My father's like, oh, you're going to be all right, boy. Let's go, right? And then number five came, and they said, uh, the Miami Heat pick, Mark Kessler. And my dad was like, oh, man, what that? And I look back, and he goes, don't worry about it, son. You'll be next, right? So <laughs> number nine comes, right? He was going up eight, nine. And I go, he looked back at me, oh, man. He go, don't, number nine, somebody got picked. And he said, I look back, he goes, don't worry about it, son. You're going to be next. So number 17 came, Vlad. And it's the New York Knicks. And he know we, St. John's is in New York. We going to the New York Knicks. And he go, the 17th pick, David Stern, the commissioner says, the New York Knicks pick, Jay. And my father tells him, yeah, Ron Mustaf. He's like, oh, shit. So I sit back. He was like, don't worry about it, son. We're going to be next. But I double looked back, and he looked over at my mother. And he said, Barbara, I told you this boy ain't going to never be Dilly Squat. He said, he said, he gonna have me laying bricks the rest of my life. He ain't gonna never get picked. That's a Jew story. <laughs> well, he did get picked as a 21st pick to the Phoenix Suns. Oh, boy. I know where you're going with this, right? So, right. Yeah. So then you get traded immediately to the 76ers. Right. Well, when they drafted me to the Phoenix Suns, it was tough to get me out to Phoenix because I knew at the 22nd pick I was going to New Jersey. So I was like, why are they drafting me? And I said something like, I don't even know where Phoenix was. Bunch of redneck pickup driving, this and that and that, so ignorant. And I remember that the governor came on with a state emergency. So we don't want that guy here. And uh, I remember for them to get me there, my friends had to get me so intoxicated, get me on a plane, and now I thought I was waking up in the Soho Grand in Manhattan. And I woke up and I butt naked. I opened up the curtains and I'm going to look at Broadway or Grand Street. And I look down and there's nothing but desert. And I said, oh my God, they don't drop the bomb. So I'm running around and I'm getting on the phone to the front. That's oh, is my dad and mom okay? They're like, what? And I hear a knock at the door, right? And it's the owner, Jerry Colangelo and and Cotton Fist Simmons, the coach, and I open the door naked, sweaty, and I'm going, what happened? What? Are we safe? Is the world gone? And Jerry Colangelo looked over at Cotton Fist Simmons and said, oh, sh we got a problem now, you know? And that was a true story, and uh, we fought, and they ended up trading me to the 76ers where I played with your guy, Charles Barkley. Okay. And I guess you were on the 76ers for two seasons, but you were pretty much on the bench the whole time. Yeah, I was on the bench. I played with the, one of my most favorite people in this whole world is Charles Barkley, Curtis Martin, and Charles Oakley. Um, Charles Barkley took me under his wing, which I wish he didn't. Um, 
because at St. John's, you remember, I had my children, and I had Coach Connor second. I had structure. Uh, I knew I had to be at all the time. I remember going to my first practice with uh, Charles Barkley, who didn't practice, who never practiced. In two years, he practiced twice. He used to come in Brad, and get on the stationary bike and ride one mile an hour, and he'll take McDonald's, and he'll take uh, 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 the hot cakes and sausage and the butter and the syrup and put it in a, like a tortilla and squish it, and it'll all be coming out. It looks so good, especially when you're hung over. And he'd be eating it, and he'd be like, y'all run the floor. And he'd be pedaling one mile an hour, and we'd be running up and down practice, and he'd just sitting on the side. That's why we ain't going to never be shit, because you guys don't run the floor. Man, practice harder. That, that, that pancakes be spitting out. And then after practice, I'm dead tired. And I say, well, man, oh, what do we do now? Oh, we got to go. And I'm thinking like study hall or something. You go, that's it, man. Two hours. we see you tomorrow. I'm like, that's all? And he's like, where you want to go? You want to go to the bar? And I was like, what? And I had all this free time on my hand. And I hung out with Charles. And they had to get rid of both of us in Philadelphia. So then you get traded to the New Jersey Nets. Yes. And was that like a, a, a big, did you have a good contract at that point or not really? Uh, not really. I'll tell you a story with there. You know, my dad went everywhere with me. Um, and when I was up for the contract, uh, I told my dad, I said, Dad, you don't want to come in there with me, you know, in my agent because they're going to try to lower the price. So you sit outside and my dad, no, I'll come in there with you. What they going to say? They can't say, now you got to understand. This time my dad didn't know I drank or act crazy. My dad only saw what he saw. Um, and when we sat in there, uh, I remember uh, the president of the Nets, Mr. Michael Rowe, who I love, he said, Jason, you sure you want your dad in here for what we're about to do? And I was like, I'm looking at Mike like, you better not, you better not say nothing, you know, just, you know, and my dad was like, yeah, well, it's okay, well, let, let's get it on, right? And uh, he was so excited for me. And then they said, okay. They said, the first day of the season, you know, Jason and Derek Coleman get into a fight. Second day of the season, Jay came in late. Third day of the season, then they got there. All right, uh, October 18th, Jay didn't come to practice. You know, and, and my father looking over like, like he ain't never, like, right? And I don't worry about it, Dad. They just trying to get the price down. Don't worry about it. And he was like, what? And in time we got to November, and it was like, in November, he, you know, he came in and said this, that, and that, and my father, and he's like, oh, man. He said, I said, Daddy, just trying to get the, they, that ain't true. He's like, some of it got to be true. And, 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 and he said, can we have a timeout? And my dad used to dribble basketball with two hands. He didn't know nothing about basketball. He said, look here, Jake. He said, whatever them man, whatever them man going to give you, you need to take. Because all that stuff they talking about, and we ain't even, you got this much more to go. He said, hell, shit, you should pay them to play here. So it ended up taking a bad contract, but ended up working out better because I got to be a better player and got a better contract. Okay. Now, for the first three seasons, I guess you only had like 12 starts. Wow. During the, is that right? <laughs> you, you breaking me down. I just, damn, that's it? Okay. So it started out a little bit slow over there. Yeah. Okay. Is this New, New Jersey? I, is this New Jersey yeah. you're talking about? Is this New Jersey, Wow. Yeah. I thought, I'd, see, I thought I was better. It's all good. It's all good because we're going to get to, you know, as things progress. But it seems like around that time you started getting into issues yes. and into problems. So I guess in 1992 you broke a beer mug over someone's head in yeah. Chicago? Yeah. Um, we, were in a, we were in a bar in Chicago and somebody tried to pull a knife out. Somebody did pull a knife out on Charles Barkley when we were in the bar and I hit him over the head with the mug. The guy got arrested and we went on from there. Okay. Shouldn't have been there. And that, okay. And then, and, and I, I read the book, you know, I read your book when you addressed this, but I guess you were blamed for firing off a semi-automatic weapon at, at the Meadowlands, uh, Meadowlands uh, Sports Complex in New Jersey, but I guess you said that was your friend who did it? No, I didn't say that was my friend. I did that, you know, we up, which having target practice in the back of the parking lot, nobody was around. I did that. Okay, okay. I, I might be getting it mistaken with, a, with another situation. Yeah. But there, there was something where you said that your, the, the, your friend did something, but you didn't want, you, you would never snitch on your friends. No, so. I'll, take, I'll take that 
I did that. Uh, yeah, we shoot okay. at old tires. Okay. What are you doing as a NBA player shooting off guns in the parking lot of the stadium that you play at? Uh, low self-esteem, right? Be honest, low self-esteem. Why in the world would I even have a gun? You know, now I'm older. We're going to get into a part where I can never make up for the accident that I had. Why would I ever need a gun? When you go to a club, nobody's going to bother you. You got more security from the club. It happens when you're around the wrong people. You let yourself be surrounded by people that you think that you have to show or put on a facade or something like that to make yourself look tougher because they might know your secrets. They might know this or that or whatever. And it's not really for your protection. It's from you not looking like a whatever in front of the people that you don't even know who you surrounded yourself with. My low self-esteem is the only reason. That's it, Brad. Yeah, I mean, you've seen you've seen these gun issues in professional sports. Not often, but there's some pretty big ones. I mean, there's a Gilbert Arenas situation where he pulled out a gun in the locker room arguing with a teammate. Uh, you know, I interviewed Marcellus Wiley, and he told me about how he started carrying a gun everywhere just out of paranoia, and then at one point he almost pulled it out on someone that was just asking for directions. And, and then one night, this guy rolled up on me at the club after it. Two something in the morning, I'm going home. I'm in the car by myself, and he walks in front of my car and stops. And then he looks at me. Then he turns around, U turns, and starts to come to my, my driver's side door. <clears throat> I got a gun with me. So all of a sudden, I pull my gun out, turn it towards the door, turn it towards him, and was like, I hope this ain't that. You know, these, these things start to, you know, being rich, famous, a target, ego, money, all that put together, and you throw guns into the mix, you start having some bad situations occur. Terrible, terrible yeah. situations. And if you're not crystal, if you out, you know, and you might have a cocktail, two or 200, it's a bad mix. I'll be the first one to tell you, man. Guns and alcohol, you know, that was a warning sign then. You know, I, I would never touch a gun for the rest of my life. There was a situation with uh, Minute Bowl where you, uh, I guess his <laughs> uncle was messing with you. <laughs> now, that, that story is definitely fabricated a lot, but it was had some truth to it. What happened was we went to Minute Bowl's house, and Minute Bowl used to always start trouble. And you went in there, and everybody was seven foot, including his wife, uh, his daughters. Everybody was just big people. And this one dude just kept staring at me, and he kept going, you know, and I said, Manu, what's wrong with your, with your uncle? You know, what's going on? Well, you know, why he keeps standing? Like, Don't mess with him. He's a warrior. But he was the only kind of small guy in the room. He's about 5'10", but he had on like a grass skirt, you know, and his, then he had his face painted. And I was like, wow, this must be a setup, but whatever. And he was like, you know, and then he looked at me and said, you think you're a tough guy? And I was like, no. And he said, well, you're a tough guy. He goes, he goes, if, 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 if you tail out a knife and you try to stab me with Ben, and, and if, you, if you take a gun and you point it at me, he said, uh, you know, it, 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 it would miss and it would bounce off me and something like that. And then the story went like, I pulled out a gun and he said, no, 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 no. Oh, shit, this don't work after 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, that's how the story embellished. It was just nothing, but we were doing some drinking and, uh, and, and the story embellished and something like that. You know, I work with Manute's family right now. I just got off the phone with it. It was nothing like that. We joke about, but no. He was like, that was, that was, that was making for good reading. Right. Well, and then uh, you were at your house, I guess, with your friends shooting off uh, a Desert Eagle? That was, we were shooting off a Desert Eagle, yes. Yeah. Right. See, we write a and book. Right. Almost, uh, yeah. Well, shot off yeah. a Desert Eagle. Um, and to be quite honest, I wasn't even the guy who fired the gun. Uh, the gun, we were all firing it, and the sound of the first time he heard a Desert Eagle, one of the other players fell to the ground because it was so loud, and the, the legend went on as we drank and went to dinner and, and, and went on like that. But if you speak to, uh, you know, Wayne, uh, he'll tell you nothing like that. It was just, it was just reckless behavior, 
of, of a guy who has 220 acres of land and, you know, has skeet machines and shot guns and shot for sport, not for hunt. So that's where we went. Right. I mean, in your first book, Loose Balls, I mean, I guess there was nine different instances about guns in that story. Right. So you, you're starting to see kind of a theme start to develop in your life with J.C. Williams and guns. Yep. It's a rec recurring theme. Right. For the first few years with the New Jersey Nets, things were a little bit slow, but then you started to have a starting position in 1996. Okay. Yeah, I was the right, sixth right. man for a while. Yeah, sixth okay. or seventh man, right. Okay. So in 1996, you kind of started get, really getting into your groove. Okay. And then in 1997, you were the rebound king. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was me and Dennis Rodman. Uh, somebody once told me in the locker room, Paul Silas, he said, Jay, they're not going to pass you the ball. You got other all-stars. And I remember Chuck Daly once telling me, he says, I gave him some advice. He said, Chuck, if you played me, he said, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. He says, I only take shit from my two best players, and you're not one of them. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to do some work in this offseason. I became better after the advice of Paul Silas and Butch Beard telling me to remember that these guys who are all-stars on our team are only shooting 35%. That means every 6.5 shots that they take, they're going to miss once you become an offensive rebounder. And I became a very good offensive rebounder. I grabbed the ball, give it back out to people that can actually put it back into the bucket. I couldn't. Would you say you were better than Dennis Rodman during that time? I think I ran the floor better than Dennis. I think I scored the ball better than Dennis. I think that I was a better offensive rebounder than Dennis Rodman. I think Dennis Rodman was a better all-around winner than I was. Um, and that's what counts. He won games. I didn't. Right. Well, he was also on a, essentially the best team of all time. <laughs> I won't agree with that. I won't disagree with that. I'm sorry. I won't disagree with that. Yeah, he was on a very good team uh, with somebody who pushed him. Look, I played with Charles Barkley. I love him to death. But Charles Barkley would beat you up in practice for playing him too hard. And then you have, you know, Michael Jordan would beat you up for not playing him hard enough. Well, you actually led the league in offensive rebounds that year. Uh, as well as, like, I mean, I'm looking through the list here. Offensive rebound percentage. Top five in total rebounds, rebounds per game, total rebound percentage, and offensive ratings. And uh, you made it to the All-Star game that year. Yes. In New York. Yep. That was in 1998. Yep. And uh, you actually made it to two different playoffs uh, with the Nets. So you were actually building up to be a pretty major player. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I guess you got a $90 million contract? Yep. But what year was that? Did you get that contract? 97, 98. Okay. How did it feel to go from this, you know, this kind of crazy background where your parents are struggling and, you know, all this kind of violence and, and everything is happening, and now you're being presented with $90 million, multi-generational wealth. How did you take that? Uh, I remember doing a lot of good for a lot of people. I remember donating to a lot of diseases. I remember, um, I remember giving St. John's $2.1 million. I asked at a dinner who gave the most to any university. Somebody said Steve Smith for $2 million. I said, well, I'm going to give 2.1. I remember doing a lot of good with it. I remember building a big house for all my family to come live in and my close friends and family to come in on the weekends. Um, but I also remember, uh, thinking that you're invincible uh, and thinking that you got the world figured out. And uh, people coming to tell me, say, hey, Jay, you know, um, like, uh, you know, that's not your money anyway. That's God's money, and you better be a good steward of it. And, uh, you know, I was feeling pretty damn good about myself, Vlad. Okay, so here you are, huge contract. You're with a team that's making the playoffs. You're an all-star now. And then April 1999, you were, uh, you were playing a game with Stefan Marbury as your teammate, and you guys, I guess, collide mid-game? Yeah, I was going in for offensive rebound, and Dukembe Mutombo knocked uh, 
Stephon Marbury back into my leg while it was stiff like this, right before I planted. It broke my leg. Uh, it broke my tibula, my fibula, and my kneecap. When that break happened, did you realize how bad it was right then and there? Yeah. Once I heard the snap twice, I said, this is going to be pretty bad. And I remember the ambulance ride over every time we hit a bump. I remember Danny Aiello, the great actor. Uh, he was in the car with me um, in the ambulance, and so was uh, my coach from college, Ron Rutledge. And I remember every bump we hit, it was immense pain. And that wasn't a sprain. Um, that wasn't like a break in the foot. That was a lot of things going wrong. And then after the tw you know thing on, I remember they stopped for like lunch during my surgery to come back to complete it. Uh, Dr. Russell Warren at Hospital of Special Surgery. So um, I knew it was pretty bad. I know if anything, it was going to be a long time before I played again. Right. I guess they put a metal plate and five screws were put into your leg. And I mean, you came back on the team, but you never played again, right? No, I tried to make a comeback. Uh, it just did never really did work out. And then I ended up breaking my other foot for overcompensating. Uh, and they got two screws on my two fifth metal tosses on both sides of my feet right now. Okay. So then you announced your retirement uh, June 28th, 2000. Uh, 32 years old, nine seasons in. And I guess with the way the NBA works with that $90 million contract, they had to pay you that whole contract? Yes, the insurance company has to pay Lloyds of London. Oh, what ah, it, oh, right. Ah, okay, I see what it is. So, yeah, okay, so I, I see what it is. So the NBA team basically signs a contract for $90 million and then they pay the insurance company just in case. And in this case, boom, the insurance company pays. So you got $90 million for playing one season, basically? Yeah, uh, basically... If you want to put it that way, uh, you know, all the things I had to work up to get to that. I played a lot of basketball. So then you retire. Here you are, a young man, early 30s, with $90 million, you know, minus the taxes and the agent fees and whatever else, but still a massive amount of money. How did you start really, you know, what did you start doing with your life? right afterwards probably crying in my own beer uh, which you know I shouldn't have been uh, poor me poor me why this happened to me uh, my dad snapped me out of it uh, said man get people out here school teachers and police officers and you got opportunity to change the world get up and get back at it and I signed uh, a contract with NBC to do the games and I was on NBC calling the games, doing pre-game, post-game, halftime shows for the NBA on NBC. Okay. How long did that contract last? Uh, that was a one-year contract. Okay. Why did they not renew? Because I had an accident at my home. Aha. So this was 2002. Right. Okay. So let's talk about that. So February 14th, 2002. Uh... You were working with some kids, I guess, uh, like a, a young team? Yeah, working with a, a team earlier in the day. But remember, I had kids, and then my kids that I adopted had kids. So I had mm -hmm. my grandchildren. We went to a Harlem Globetrotter basketball game uh, with my dad and my grandchildren and uh, a bunch of other players that were playing on the travel team that we had. Okay, so you end up hiring a limousine driver, uh, Gus Christoffi. Yes, we went out after the game. A couple of the players said, hey, man, can we come back, check out your house? Um, I said, sure. They came back. We met at a restaurant, and at the restaurant, the owner of the restaurant called the limousine to take uh, some of those players back to my home. Uh, Mr. Christoffi came in, had dinner with us, had a good time, and then he drove us. I drove my car home, and then... He followed us in the limousine. It was the first night I ever met Mr. Christoffi. Okay. So you, your kids and grandkids and Mr. Christoffi were all at your house and you started showing them your gun collection. I started showing, I had some other players in the house too. Um, and I went to my bedroom and I had my shotguns for my skeet machine uh, in there. 
and there was a bullet still in one of the shotguns uh, from shooting skeet early in the day. I take responsibility. I'm not going to say somebody did that, that, and that. I was supposed to look down the barrel. I was showing people guns. Here goes a gun. Here, look at this one. You know, this coach gave me this. This is beautiful. This. And when I went to slap the gun, close the hand it, I didn't even know that Mr. Christoffi was in the house there. The gun went off and hit Mr. Christoffi in the chest. And uh, it killed him instantly. I then jumped, ran out the house, jumped into the swimming pool, came back up, and we called 911 instantly after it happened. But I just panicked. I did a cowardly act of not staying there after an accident and taking it. I tried to cover it up, and I, w I ended up going to trial for this, Vlad. Um, the trial took eight years. I ended up going to jail for aggravated assault. Um, we know it's an accident. I took care of their family. That's, I'm not saying that that suffices uh, because you took everything a man has and everything he's going to have for the rest of his life. He just got out of where he, a bad situation in his life where he's, go, he's coming out and get his life together where I'm going in now. Um, he didn't have any family. He had a sister. She forgave me. I don't know if it was more of a letter she forgave me. She never came up and told me. She's probably still angry with me, and I understand that. Um, I went on, and I went to prison for 27 months for obstruction of justice was the main charge. And that's where I'm at. Well, when the gun went off and, and he got hit, what was the first thing that started going through your mind? Because obviously it was an accident. What, what the hell just happened? Yeah. It was, it, bam! And I, what the hell just happened? And then I, and I just panicked. And Well, you said you tried to cover it up. Like, how did you try to cover it up? I went and jumped in the swimming pool and then stood there when the police were coming. Um, we were trying to come up with a story instead of, you know, just telling the truth of what happened, just in shock. And when the police come, it was obviously, you know, that I was reckless. And that's what I went to jail for. Okay. So you were arrested that day. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, were you given a bond? Yes. Okay. So you paid your bond, and the whole, you know, you went through the court process for eight years. The whole time, were you out on bond, or did you have to sit in jail for a while? No, I was out on bond uh, for the eight years. It was eight years of every day seeing your lawyer, um, some days going to court consistently, fighting motions and doing different things. It was a living hell. Uh, not knowing your future, but it was just pale in comparison to what happened to Mr. Christoffi and his family. So it was just a bad time for everyone. I've caused a lot of pain, Vlad. I caused a lot of pain in that situation. I know you want to stay here and, and at this situation and go by it detail for detail. Um, I was reckless. I'm sorry. I take full responsibility to that. I paid my debt to society. And there's not a day that goes by where I don't think that I did enough. You know, I think that I'm at Futures Recovery Healthcare every day trying to help people get better while I'm helping myself because there's something I'm never going to be able to get over. So I do these interviews for one reason. I don't want nobody to feel sorry for me or judge me or where they can judge me. It's, 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 I do it to release the stigma of addiction. That's where I'm at in my life. I understand that I was reckless, I was careless, I was a coward for doing what I did. No, I, I respect that. And it seems like when you were going through the trial as you were waiting for the sentencing and so forth, there was a situation where uh, you got tased by the police. I yeah. guess you were suicidal. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, I wasn't suicidal that day. I was drinking and somebody, I asked somebody for a sleeping pill and they gave me a Xanax. I never tried a Xanax. A bunch of alcohol and a Xanax don't work together. Um, 
Uh, I was on the phone with uh, uh, somebody, and they said, what do you do? I said, I was drinking shots at the bar, and they thought they said shots fired. And the police came up and broke down the hotel room door. They took me in, um, and I got tased. I was butt naked. I was over. And, you know, not to make light of it, if you ever want to get tased uh, butt naked, and when they hit you with that and your nuts is... Uh, it was a, a terrible feeling. It was embarrassing again to my family and everybody else to have to go and, I, and, and they pretty much marched me, and me for uh, three days and I decided I need more time. And I stayed seven days. I was able to go up to the roof where they had kids from foster places and when the foster parents don't want them, they bring them to St. Vincent's Hospital and they leave them there. I got a relationship with them. I held that relationship with them forever. I needed time then. Uh, you know, I've caused a lot of pain to a lot of people, Brad. What else, you know, I, I you know, it, it ain't something that you can just flip a switch, man. You know, I'm doing the best that I can where I'm doing it at. Uh, it's something that you're never gonna get over. It's not an hour that goes by I don't think about this. When I'm having too much fun, I think about it. When I do these interviews, I think about it. I don't know what else to, 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 to do but to keep doing what I'm doing and taking it one day at a time, one breath at a time, man. Well, I think you're helping a lot of people by talking about it and actually not dodging any of the questions and admitting to the mistakes you made and not blaming anybody else. I, there's nobody to blame, Vlad. I'm right. not blaming exactly. you for giving me this interview. I've been doing these hard interviews and, 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 and understand, I, I do enough for myself to bring this back up. I don't need to keep bringing it back up in detail. Like, trust me, I heard from this. I heard from taking a man's life accidentally. I don't need to live it every day on TV and this. I do these interviews so I can help people get better from addiction. I don't do it for, I don't, nobody's gonna feel sorry for me. You don't feel sorry. I don't want you to. It hurts enough, trust me, if somebody thinks that I'm out here going around going, wow, man, I feel good about myself. I don't. I don't feel good about myself. Yeah. Well, well I guess a month before your sentencing, you end up getting into a DUI where you, uh, you were drunk and you ended up crashing into a tree. Yeah, and, and, that, was, and that was my first. And then I got into another DWI, and that's what brought me to treatment after an intervention. Yeah, I was under no, no excuses. Shouldn't be drinking and driving. I don't do it now. I never would do it. I didn't know where to go. I lost my family. Yeah, my, I lost my sense of who I was at that time. Maybe I was, maybe I was looking for an out. I don't know, but I shouldn't have been on the road. I could have hurt more people. You were finally, well, on January 11, 2010, you pleaded guilty to aggravated assault. Uh, eight years after the situation happened, and then you were sentenced, uh, well, you were sentenced to five years in prison, uh, which you ended up doing like two and a half years? 27 months. 27 months. Um, and then you also had the DUI, the DWI, which I guess you got a year for? Is that yeah. concurrently? No, or, yeah, or they afterwards? ran it, right, you know, instead of running them together, they ran, I got out on parole, and instead of going home, they took me to Rikers Island uh, for the DWI. Okay, and, what and, was and, worse? And, uh, where, did you, where did you stay in prison? Uh, which prison did you stay at? I stood in Mid-State Prison. Uh, first started at the Trenton, and then went on to Mid-State Prison, and from Mid-State Prison, went on to Rikers Island. What was worse, prison or Rikers Island? Right here in my head, my brain was worse than all of them. That's the biggest prison and the toughest prison I've ever been in. The one in this conversation that me and you are having right now. That's a prison. You know, you talked about, you know, you wrote a book called Humbled, Letters from Prison, where you were writing your father, uh, you know, your experiences about going through. And you were talking about how, you know, you're dealing with the various gangsters and gangs in that, in that prison and the politics and everything else like that, but everyone kind of looked up to you and never really gave you any issues. Yeah, not because I'm a tough guy, uh, because I didn't go in thinking I was somebody. 
I was humbled. And that didn't mean walking around with my head down. That mean I totally needed to be dependent on God. I needed a higher power. I'm claustrophobic. I wasn't worrying about one or two people in jail. I'm not a tough guy. But when you got 15,000 people and 2,500 people at Rikers that come in and out every day, do you think I'm, am, I'm, I'm safe without? You know, it's, uh, it, it's the way I, I was from New York City. I've done a lot in Newark. My dad worked in Newark. We did a whole lot. So people weren't coming in there, and I didn't come in there going, I'm Jason Williams, NBA All-Star, this and that and that. Did I have fights in prison? Yeah, I had fights. Did I cause those fights? Yes, I did. Um, uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a cakewalk. Um, it was just, there was times where, look, man, the coldest thing somebody ever told me, Vlad, I was losing my mind at the time. You get cabin fever in there. There was a big dude in there. He's about 6'10". He's been in prison just about his whole life. Muscles on top of muscles. Probably can kick my ass in two seconds. And uh, we were playing like the, he got a bad haircut, and we were playing the dozens with him. And he looked at me, he was like, but Jay, I've always been on your side. You know, why are you going to do that? And I was like, you know, and I kept going. He said, hey, man, can I see you in the bathroom? And I was like, all right, let's go in the bathroom. Uh, and we went in the bathroom. And he looked at me and he said, see all these muscles, Jay? He said, see? See this bald head? He said, see, I can't really fight because I'm so big, you know? He said, but everybody think I can fight. But don't let me jump off on your big ass and find out you can't fight either. And that was the coldest shit somebody's ever told me in prison, right? That backed me up. But he could fight. I've seen him fight. Right? And you got to understand, you're in there with good, uh, look, man, I'm not going to say anybody in prison is any worse than I am. Uh, you in prison and you have to do what you have to do to survive until you can get back to your family. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, was it a cakewalk? No. It wasn't no cakewalk. Um, did I, should I say I paid my debt to society and, and I want to be forgiven and I should be back on TV or I should be back? No. 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 I did something that could have been avoided. And, and, and this is the hell you're going to live through. Well, yeah, I, I interviewed uh, Shaka Senghor. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was, uh, he was a guy from Detroit uh, who killed somebody in a, in a drug deal gone bad after he had just been shot six months earlier. So he was paranoid. He was carrying a gun around because he didn't want to get shot again. And then the situation happened. He ended up killing the person. It was after that moment where you realize that anybody can die out here. Like, it don't matter. It don't matter how tough you think you are, how much money you make in, how much you think you're the man. Like, anybody can get killed out here on any given day. And, like, that shifted everything inside of me, you know? And so, from that moment forward, I never left the house without a gun. You know, I had a gun even when I was in the house. Like, that's just what I was on. And I started making it up in my mind that if I find myself in a conflict, I'm shooting first. And 16 months later, that's what happened. And he did, I think, like 25 years in prison. And he wrote a book called Writing My Wrongs, uh, which ended up being a New York Times bestseller. And Oprah had him on his show. And now he's doing you know, TV shows with Oprah. And he said something very interesting. And he said that you are not defined by your worst moment. And, and he killed somebody, and he, he understands the, the repercussions of it and so forth. But just because you had one bad moment in your life does not make you a bad person. And I think that when you look at prisons and the people who are in prisons, most of them are there because of a split-second decision, pride, a, a, you, you know, know a, a anger, a, testosterone, addiction, whatever. Addiction. Addiction. 80% of yeah. the people in prison are there for addiction, don't need to be there. I needed to be there. But addiction, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, some people might say Jason Williams got 27 months for, for ending a man's life because he had millions of dollars. If it was Jason Williams, the bus driver, he might have gotten 20 years. Well, it might have been Jason Williams, the bus driver. It wouldn't have been at this point. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have been, it would have been a civil case, uh, right? It might have been yeah. blown up like this, but regardless of what, it was me. And, yeah. and one day is a lot. And 27 months is what I got for the cover-up. It was an accident. I had an accident. 
and then I tried to do something as a cowardly act, and that's what I went to prison for. I had a yeah. trial by jury. You got out in 2012. Is that, is that accurate? Is that after the Rikers? Uh, that sounds about accurate, yes. Okay. How did it feel? I mean, so here you are, you're going in as a millionaire, and that doesn't really matter in prison. I mean, yeah, your commissary might have a few more snacks, but that's about it. Well, well look, it's who you are, right? Because you, it, the difference in jail, Vlad, is that when you're in jail, it's 364 days or less. So you're going to absolutely be who you can be because you know you're going to be transferred or you're going to get out of there. When you're in prison, that's who you are, right? You're going to be there because you're going to do 365 days or to the rest of your life. So it's, there's, no, there's, no, there, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing easy about that. There, there, there's nothing easy about nobody's ever come up to me and say, yo, Jay, give me your money or Jay, give me this. You know, I participated in everything there. I was in the basket. I did things. I, 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 I carried myself uh, the correct way there. I understand I'm no boss. Um, you know, but nobody came up to me and said, Jay, give me money, give me noodles, give me cigarettes. They said, Jay, can you help me when I get out of here? He says, you know, can you help me get a job? And that's what, if you give a man a job, you give him self-respect and he can go back to his family. Nobody ever asked me for anything in jail, but for self-respect. And that was a job. Yeah. So you walk out in 2012. How did it feel to walk outside those walls and see see the outside for the first time? And, and you know, really, I mean, 27 months. I mean, like two and a half. Sorry, uh, 27. Yeah, almost three years, really. Oh, I got, Charles Oakley picked me up with some friends, and we went to get Italian dinner because there is no cheese or tomatoes in prison. I okay. ate, I ate so much cheese that I got blocked up, had to go to the emergency room. Uh, Are you so, serious? That's a true story. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, Vlad, there's some things that we need to work on is because, look, man, when I came out of prison and all those few good things that you said about me, you know, I still could not get a place to stay, right, because I was a convicted felon. So I don't know if you know that I had to live in a hotel while I was doing my parole. And, it, you know, I had because when you are a convicted felon, I went to apply at this building and said, denied. I didn't know that. I was like, wow, I'm denied. Why? I said, my credit's good. My money's good. Why? And they're like, you just denied. So I went to another building, another building, and then another building. And then I went to the Yale club and gave a speech. And the lady came up to me at the end. She goes, yeah, I own those buildings and I'm the one denying you. True story, right? And it's the Ratner group. And she said the HOA, homeowners association or the tenant groups, didn't want a convicted felon in there. And if you are a convicted felon, you can't. And even if it's not me, the people that have to move back to the projects, you're not around to be, when you get out of prison and you're still on parole, you can't go back to the projects because you can't be around other parolees. So where else can you live? Here I am supposed to be, you know, Mr. Mr. You know, and here I am, I can't find a place to live and nobody would let me in. And she gave me an opportunity to live in that building and that kind of Help me out, but I couldn't find a place to live, Vlad. Oh yeah, I uh, I interviewed Kerry Lathan. He was one of the people shot during the Nipsey Hustle murder. He was uh, standing next to Nipsey at the time, and he got shot himself by Eric Holder. And right after he got shot, he had just got out of doing like thirty-five years for murder, and they arrested him and put him back. And they're about to have him face another 20 years for parole violation because they say that he was associating with a known gang member. No, I, I know him because I took a few pictures with him. Right. Like that. But so the parole officer was like, well, you have gang affiliation. I said, look, man, I know Nicky about as much as I know you. You're my parole officer. I met you. We've talked a few times. That's as far as I know him. Yeah. Now, when I first came home, Nipsey heard that I was home, and he filled up my little sister's backseat of her car with clothing for me. Hmm. Got it. So I had clothes to wear. I was out seven months before this happened. 
And and we talked about that. They ultimately end up, we, the interview came out and it went viral and they ultimately ended up uh, dropping the charges and there was a GoFundMe page that helped him out and everything. But it was one of those things where we were talking about it with him and also Big U, who was also also on the phone with us, uh, you know, from the Rolling 60s, talking about, you got these guys, they're from areas that are considered gang areas. They come out, where are they supposed to go? Whereas this, their support system is their family, and their family's technically gang related, and they go back to prison for being around their whole family, their own family, and it ends up being almost a catch twenty two. Right. So, you know, I was working with Senator Cunningham in New Jersey on a bill, and she was doing the work. I just looked at the paperwork. I did very little. Um, where you don't have to check off that you were a convicted felon, um, if it wasn't for being a, a pedophile or, or something like that, you sh you know, uh, but it's something that you, bro, that application don't mean nothing with the internet today, right? Like, I've done everything a man's supposed to do and not supposed to do. And most of the stuff I am embarrassed about. I am an open book. I'm transparent. But for the average person who don't have the resources or the connections that I have, life can be, it can be, it can be dangerously unknown for them. Well, yeah, it can the, be the revolving door of prison. Right, right, and you get in. You, get, you get out, can't find a place to live, can't find a job, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go back to doing something legal, then you get caught again. But like, I remember reading this one story, um, it, it was about a guy who had two strikes, and he got caught forging like $2,000 worth of checks, which ended up being a felony, third strike, life in prison. Over $2,000. Like how, you know, when you look at it, someone like you and me who have money, $2,000, we could spend that at dinner. Like this guy's doing life in prison over a minuscule amount of money. Um, so what happened to your house? Because you had a 30,000 square foot house. Yeah, that me and my dad built. Uh, uh -huh. You know, we built that house ourselves, brick by brick. That house was sold to a guy named John um, who came in and bought the house. And um, I moved to South Carolina, back to South Carolina for a little while. And uh, now it's been resold. I don't go back that way. Um, yeah. Well, why, why didn't you just, you know, once you started reaching the problems of trying to rent something, why not just buy a condo or buy a house or something like that at that point? You can't, Vlad, homeowners association. HOA, they mm. were worse than renting. I go over uh, there and want to buy something, and the first thing they say is, we don't want him here. Hell, they wouldn't give Tim Tebow a place, right? I end up getting a place in that building, Tim Tebow didn't. And Tim Tebow just loves Jesus. <laughs> right? And I couldn't get a place, and I'm a convicted felon. So the Homeowners Association, even now, where I live in Florida, I had to go between the HOA and, and, and beg for mercy. 18 years later, right? Yeah. And it's nothing about a DWI. It's about what happened 18 years ago. So look, when, when I speak to people, my number one message for them is the consequences, right? It's the ripple effect. It's just not, you might be bad. You might be tougher than I think. You might be able to go to prison and survive. Yeah, but can your parents do it? Can your girlfriend do it? Can your wife do it? Can your kids handle it? Right? Can when you get out, can you get a job? Can you get a place to live? It ain't just about prison, right? So when people come out, I'm not asking you to have any compassion for me. I, I'm not asking that. I'm not asking. I know what I've done. I know, I know I messed up. I know it. I trust me. I'm sorry. Uh, it's but for other people that are going through it, you know, if you see that person, help. help let, let me just tell you this. My dad used to tell me this story. He used to say that. A guy was in a hole and he couldn't get up. He looked at a priest that walked by and said, Father, can you help me out? And the father said, seven, say seven Hail Marys. And, and, and he kept walking and he saw a doctor. And, and he said, Doc, can you help me out? And the doctor threw him down a prescription. He's still in the hole. And he saw his best friend. And he said, best friend, can you help me out? And the best friend jumped down in the hole with him. And he was like, well, why'd you jump down in this hole? Now we both stuck. He says, because I've been here before and I know a way out. Right? So that's what you need. You need a good support system that help you. Do you feel like a man if you came out of prison and you had money and resources and stuff to go on and you couldn't find a place to live and you had to move in with your sister? Then you're a burden, right? 
And we, you know, we look at each other like if you're a convicted felon, like that's what defines you for the rest of your life. You know, I'm forever helping people like that. You know, hey man, I might know a place, I might can help you, I might can get you into some place, and that's a lot of my work. I don't go on TV and say, this is my work, this is what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's, it's what happens. Well, I guess you're involved in a, in a rehab facility? Yes. It's can called Futures, yeah, Futures Recovery Healthcare. Uh, we have 10 acres down in Florida. We have everything from detox to outpatient. Um, it's a beautiful facility. We got 13 therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists. We got 24-hour uh, nursing. We got doctors on staff. But what makes us different, we have three different programs. One for core, which is just everybody coming in. Uh, and then we have one for people that don't want to be seen, you know, high-profile people. And then we have another one uh, called Rebound, where um, I spend a lot of my time, I spend a lot of my time at all three of them, and we do, we teach through a 12-step program with the same stuff, the same classes and the groups, but we go out every day for three or four hours, and we do skydiving, scuba diving, snorkeling, wave running, paddle boarding, basketball, golf, museums, uh, uh, butterfly world, monkey jungle. We do things to break up the monotony, you know, uh, build self-esteem, break down barriers, overcome anxiety, because if I'm throwing you out of an airplane at 13,000 feet to skydive it, I'm going to see something different than me and you sitting across from each other in this interview, right? And mm -hmm. our therapists are there with us, so they get to see when you're scared, because depression comes from not knowing, and not knowing is what brings on fear and anxiety, you know? And, you know, I'm so proud to be a part of Futures, you know? And that's what keeps me going. I've been in this for four years, you know? And I can't I'm safe there. When, when I leave your show, I go back there. And I'm safe because I'm around people who don't judge. Because if we got time to judge, we don't have time to love. And we might be cracked, but we're not broken. And we just work in our own coat. We, and when you leave our program at Futures, Vlad, I talk to you every single day. We got a video messaging app, and I get a chance to see if, if you got on sunglasses and it's raining. I said, something's wrong. It's not a phone call. We get a chance to stay in contact. And that's where my life is. If your name doesn't say futures, uh, you know, recovery, healthcare behind it when the phone rings, rebound, I'm most likely not going to pick it up, even for my own family. That's my life now. That's where I'm at. I, through the grace of God, I've been able to help people beat addiction. And um, through the grace of God, we at Futures are very good at that. And after this interview, you know, this is, this is therapy, right? This is therapy. Yeah. A lot of stuff that you brought up to me, I don't, I didn't remember. Um, I remember all the stuff of February 14th. Um, thanks for bringing that up and bringing that out. Uh, it's not like I don't think about it every time, Vlad. You know, when I leave here, I get in this car, you know, doing this interview. It, 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 it's nothing that I'm proud of. It, it, it's, or, or not, not you, Vlad, any of these interviews. My kids don't like it. They don't like it when they got to go to school and I got to rehash stuff. But this is what I do to release the stigma, right? If you have cancer, you get treatment. If you have, you get chemo, chemo if you have cancer. And if you have an addiction, you get treatment. And I'm trying to release the stigma of it. You know, I, I know I've messed up in a lot of things. I'm just trying to do the right thing and I'm not doing it to make you happy or the world happy. I'm doing it so I can put my own oxygen mask on now so I can help others and to get my family back and get me back to where I need to be. And I've been doing this for four years and, and, I, and I'm passionate about helping people get better and we're damn good at it. And, and, and look, you don't have to come to our place, you know, you know call 855, right? I'll give you the 502 Hope. Call Rebounds Recovery Healthcare. And I tell you, if you say, hey man, you know what? I'm a Nick fan, I never did like you. I say, man, let me help you get to another place. But go get it because life is so much better, you know? It is. It's just so much better when, you, when you're living on the straight and narrow. This kind of reminds me of an interview I did with Big U, who was one of the head guys of the Rolling 60s. And he's been responsible for a lot of violence over the course of his life. He did a lot of bad things. But at one point, he became Muslim. And he realized that unless he does a lot of good during the rest of his life to make up for all the bad, He's not going to get into heaven. Yeah, I want to. I'm trying to get into heaven. You know what I mean. So, so you feel that some of the stuff you've done in the past, you have to make up for? No, I know it. You I know. Mean, it. I want to balance 
I don't want to. I don't want to be remembered for being the the this negative force. So he's devoted his life these days to getting gang violence down in L.A. lower than it ever has since there's been gangs. Wow. He he sponsors youth football programs. Him and Snoop have entire youth programs, and some of these kids end up going to the NFL. Like like he's there. You know, he was the one responsible for the, the gang march after Nipsey's death, where the rolling 60s and the A-Tray gangsters that had been killing each other for 40 years marched together peacefully for the first time ever over a 40-year-old war. So it seems like you understand the mistakes that you made and you're devoting your life to fixing those and to, to balancing things out in the world. And that seems to be like the focus of your life right now. 100%. You know, I love what I do. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I'm passionate about it. Uh, I, I, I'm changing the world. Like when I got to fly back tonight, I got to fly back. I pick up, we don't call each other clients. We don't call them clients when we pick them up. Call them teammates. I'll pick up somebody from the airport. They are intoxicated. They're messed up. And you bond with them. And you bond with them for the rest of your life. Now when they leave, and yeah, the days of hanging out with the greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan, you know, and Charles Barkley and Sam Cassell and Charles Oakley. And, you know, I'm now hanging out with people that like Curtis Martin, who teaches Bible study, a life application, which is our best class, Vlad. Not even our therapists down there do a better job of helping people off addiction than Curtis Martin does every Wednesday for two hours. So these are the people I hang out with. I don't do dinners. I'm a breakfast and lunch guy. I'm in the gym from four to six in the morning. At nine o'clock, I don't need an ambient to go to sleep. I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I don't have to think about the past as much. I'm not an internet guy. Um, I'm not a TV guy. I don't watch basketball as much as I probably should be, or sports. I watch one channel and it's old, like the Jeffersons and Sanford and Son. If I do get a break and I'm in the bed, I go to movies a lot. Um, I have popcorn with my, my alumni a lot. Uh, I just sit right now for right now, Vlad, and the next time I see you, <coughs> this is my life. Futures Recovery Healthcare is my life, and that's that's where I'm at, man. Well, that's great, man. That's really great, and especially because being part of this program, you're not just a sheltered pers a sheltered rich guy that's trying to do charity to to people who have less than you you actually have gone through the things they've gone through. You've actually experienced the lows. Well, well I could be a warning to some folk or an example to some folk, but most of the time I'm both, right? You know, you got these, uh, you know, your demographic, you got these kids on skateboards, you got these BMX guys. These guys are not going to treatment for the reason that, look, first of all, not that it's not cool, but first of all, they don't want to be in the class for eight or 10 hours looking across from each other. Right? They need some monotony. They need to break it up. You need to see a therapist look at you and go, hey man, you know, I saw something on you when you were about to jump out of a plane or when you were in the bottom. Of, we saw different things in you. You know, we see people in different settings, right? You can't put somebody in, my opinion, and I'm no guru on this, I'm no expert, in treatment for 30 days and not let them see outside of the walls and then release them and release them to a uh, airport and then they walk in by the first bar and then they got triggered. Why not show them all these things right now and then while they're still in treatment, if they have something that's triggering them, they can see our psychiatrists, our psychologists. So it's a different approach. You know, we have outdoor adventure therapy with the best clinical staff and that's what the connection is. And you know, and, I, and I'm gonna tell you something, Blair. You know, you know, I understood myself only after I destroyed myself, man. You know, it took a while, you know, and only in the process of fixing myself, I finally found out who I was. So life is so much better. And I say this, I lived a life of when I pull up on site, when your license is now, you know this, I, I'm sure your license hasn't been the best all the time. You pull up at a light and you look over at a police officer and your license is not bad. You don't look. You let the light go, Lord, 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 please let this light change, you know, because uh, you're, you're riding dirty. But now uh, that I, I've got it all out and I'm trying to do the best that I can in life, when I pull up, I can roll the window down and say, how you doing today, officer, and, and go about my business. I don't have to look over my shoulder anymore. I'm doing the best that I can through the grace of God and 
I just thank the opportunity for people trusting me to come down with their addictions. You know, if it's gambling, overeating, depression, anxiety, all these things, when you, you trust somebody into our care, it's, it's super special to me. I can't teach a kid a jump hook when a kid is teaching me how to help others save my own life. Just recently, DMX uh, actually checked himself back into rehab, uh, you know, and end up canceling all his shows and everything else like that just because... Well, we wrote you know, the letter for DMX. We wrote oh, the really? letter for him uh, to help him. Uh, instead of doing five years, we wrote it to his judge and to Murray Richmond, his lawyer, explaining that he wasn't trying to beat taxes on purpose. He was an addict. He's sick. And nobody's going to come home as an addict and a sick and living as sick as he did go, you know what, today I'm going to cheat on my taxes. He just didn't... That wasn't in his, that was way in his rear view mirror. His windshield, white, win, his windshield window is so much bigger, he was thinking more about getting sick or sicker than he was about paying his taxes. And where he is right now, you know, look man, God, I said it before, is not a God of second chances, he's a God of another chance, and I think he, he's gonna eventually get it right. Yeah, and I, I've interviewed his ex-wife and he was addicted to crack before he even got a record deal. This was something that started very early. And this has been a lifelong struggle for him. And the money probably made it even worse. Because now he can afford to do whatever he wants. Well, you he got to show. Rob, he didn't, before he had to rob people right. you know, for, for his addiction. Now he just does a show. <laughs> or someone just hands him the money. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad he's back into rehab because I don't want to publish another story about DMX going back to prison again. Like, it's something I've been doing year after year for the last 12 years. Eh, well, I'm glad you guys helped him out in that situation. Uh, well, Jason, thank you so much for, for sharing your story. It's a very powerful story. And I'm glad. I think very few people uh, in your situation at this financial level that you're at, most people are just very secretive. But you're actually an open book. And I think that's something that everyone's going to appreciate a lot. We can save a lot of lives, you and I, and uh, through the grace of God, and not being facetious of saying I can. Um, I appreciate you for giving me this platform. I'm proud of you. I watched you 10 years ago and going, what is this guy trying to accomplish? You know, uh, and, 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 and watch you just grow into something where you have a platform where, like a LeBron James can go out, right or wrong, he can go out and say something, and he could change the masses. And then people get on his behind when he don't say something. So everybody's expecting him to say something all the time because he's taking that position to make the world a better place. And you can do that too. And so many people are suffering that watch your show, your platform. You get some millions of people that need help from opioids, alcohol, depression, anxiety. And you're giving me this platform. Hopefully we can help some people. And I want to commend you. And uh, thank you, brother. Well, I don't think there's a hopefully. I think we are going to help some people because I've been doing this for 12 years now and I've seen the effects and I see the DMs and I see people, literally dozens of people a day saying, listen, because we never glorify anything. We never glorify the, the prison. We never glorify the, the gun violence. We never, we've interviewed people, you know, we've about half a dozen people that have killed people through various situations, accidents, self-defense and so forth. Uh, sometimes it was an accident. Sometimes it was on purpose, but it's never glorified, and we always show the repercussions, the losing 30 years of your life in prison, uh, coming out and all the money that, you, that people were holding for you is all gone now, uh, losing, having your mother die while you're locked up, uh, you know, having your best friends turn on you. It, it's, a, it's, a horrible, it's a horrible story every time, but I think it's a story that teaches people what not to do. And I think this is what this is accomplishing right now. Thank you, brother. God bless you, and I'm sorry no, about your dad. No. Thank you, man. Best of, best of luck to everything you do. Thank you. Peace.